Welcome to Sector Report. I'm David Beetson. This week, lockouts, strikes and problems in the marketplace. What's got the red meat sector revving? Agriculture faces a serious skills shortage. Can we train our way out of it? And we're in the field for Central Otago's Great Easter Bunny Hunt. After a solid afternoon shooting, the team reckoned they'd shot about a hundred rabbits. But as day became night, the real shooting was about to begin. Well, the chocolate bunny might be welcome in most Kiwi homes, but the furry kind certainly isn't in the burrow-ravaged hills of central Otago. The Great Easter Bunny Hunt's an annual event that draws fire from animal welfare advocates, hunters from all over New Zealand, and strong support from local farmers who curse the day the early settlers imported the rabbit to provide some local game. Correspondent Benedict Collins picks up the trail in Alexandra. Over the Easter holidays, countless children throughout the country were hyped up with anticipation of what the Easter Bunny would be delivering them. But Easter was a good weekend not to be a rabbit in Otago. For an Alexandra, the annual Great Easter Bunny Hunt was about to take place. <laughs> was no barrier to taking part, with both the young and the old coming from as far afield as Walkworth to turn up the heat on the region's burgeoning rabbit numbers. Nicholas Evans is only 11 years old, but in terms of the Easter bunny hunt, he's a pro. He bagged six rabbits last year, and this year he was hoping to beat that. First we set up camp, then we go and do some shooting, then we go sh spotlighting, and the next day we wake up early and shoot some more before we have to leave and come back here. But it's not just the farmers who benefit from the event. With more than 400 hunters and their supporters in town, it's great for local businesses in Alexandra too. Yeah, well we had about a tonne and a half of ammo delivered uh, this week for yep. the shoot, so yeah, and most of that's all um, pre-ordered stuff. People have sort of rung up a couple of weeks beforehand and said they need some shells, so yeah, that's what we do. And then we just bring it along here on the day and they pick it up and go for it. Cheers, buddy. As the ballot began to determine which farm blocks teams were sent to, Alexandra Lions Club organiser Dave Ramsey had some stern words for shooters after complaints from farmers last year. We've lost several farmers as a result of activities like a strainer post that was at either a deep creek or long gully that was left and 100 metres of the fence fell down. Nobody owned up. We've had gates left open on several other properties. We've lost them in perpetuity for farming as well. Mr Ramsey's message was one that the Gunners team from the New Zealand Army heard loud and clear. Get out and we'll do this, we'll do this recce and we'll have a look, have a look over the farmland and see if we see any rabbits and we'll shoot them obviously. Just watch out for your gun safety, okay? We've got probably far too many weapons for what we actually need. Okay, so uh, one person shooting at any one time, unless he's really sucking, then you can take over and smash the rabbit for him. And so we'll find the track, close all the gates as we see them, or we'll leave everything as we see it. Okay. The gunners drew one of the top blocks, just next to the Warbirds over Wanaka airfield. And soon, they were down to work. The gunners realised that they'd brought too much 22 ammunition and not enough shotgun shells. But they were having a whale of a time. It's just over five hours in. How are you enjoying it so far? I'm really enjoying it. Yep. We haven't got too many rabbits, but we'll get we'll get some more tonight. We'll get heaps tonight. Yeah. We yeah. hope. How many do you think you've shot so far? Not too many. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Missed a few? <laughs> Missed a few, yeah. Yeah. And as the rabbit count rose, it soon became clear that it was Robbo who was the gunner's dead-eyed dick. Robbo says he's been hunting since he was old enough to walk next to his dad, and it sure showed. Oh, I'm a pretty avid uh, duck shooter, eh? so I've uh, done a few clay boot shoots over the last month and a half, so um, my eyes in probably, or I could say that, so um, yeah, just give the rabbits a little bit of time, give them some lead and get into them. Yeah, yeah. How many do yeah. you reckon you've shot so far today? What, what, oh, five and a half hours in? Yeah, oh, I don't know really. I've, sort of lost count after uh, after 20 I think so <laughs> it's not that many really so it's probably a few shots that I should have been getting but I haven't been getting so yeah but you're, yeah. you're having a good time oh yeah of course yeah well you know what else could you be doing really on your weekend or your, your long Easter weekend eh? should be out here doing this yeah, yeah bugger playing a PlayStation local resident Alan Mackay says that rabbits in the area are reaching nightmarish proportions 
I mean, it's been a great breeding season and uh, yeah, no heavy rains to drown out any of the young ones. So uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say the, the rabbit numbers have doubled in, in the last couple of months. As you see here, this, this is not intensively farmed land, but I, I'd hate to think that it was because uh, for the number of rabbits per hectare, it just, you know, they'd eat you out of house and home just about. Organiser Dave Ramsey had told us that if the gunners didn't come away with several thousand rabbits off their block, then it was they who were the bunnies. But Mr Mackay disagreed, saying the clear conditions and long pasture would work against them. I feel sorry for them coming onto strange country, like it's hard enough to shoot it when you know the country. It'll make a difference, like they'll get a few hundred rabbits, but really uh, this, this block out here's most probably got a hundred rabbits on it. Yeah. So no, look, uh, I, I hate to say it, but I think the only way they're going to get on top of it here is, is if we have a hard winter and have a good poison. Run, rabbit, run, rabbit, run, run, run. The Otago Regional Council estimates that before 1997, when the Khaleesi virus was released, the rabbits were causing $50 million worth of losses to agriculture there each year. Run, rabbit, run, rabbit, run, 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 run. Ten bunnies can eat as much as one sheep, while they also destroy crops, vegetation and soil too. Since the rabbit boards went out of existence, you know, there are people and, and, and pockets of country here that uh, people aren't worrying about the rabbits. They're not, like this is the problem, these people aren't relying on the land for a living and the rabbits, uh, yeah, are winning. After a solid afternoon shooting, the team reckoned they'd shot about a hundred rabbits. But as day became night, the real shooting was about to begin. The spotlights were lit, the night vision honed. It'll be as good as any for now. And the troops headed out into the night. But would the night produce more rabbits than the day, as the hunters had been hoping? It started promisingly. But the next morning, we found some bitterly disappointed shooters. How's it going? Shit, fuck. Really? Yeah. How did the night go? Oh, terrible. Really? It's like nothing around. Yeah. There was just none around. Yeah. We probably ended up with only about 30 for the whole night. And we were out till 3, 3 o'clock in the morning. A couple kept on going all night. It was a disappointment. We've had more this morning. And it's the first time in history that I've ever we've ever shot more and at the daytime than we have at night. It's just unexplainable. Just crawling into this hole so I had to put one back in his head. <laughs> it's a disappointment. But oh, it was all good fun, eh? Hey? Yeah. Drove all around here and yeah. never saw a thing. Out in the big flat paddock out there, where there was meant to be 5,000, we saw one rabbit. One. <laughs> By the time the gunners went back to Alexandra, they had an official tally of 167 rabbits, well down on what was expected. But it was the same for all the teams. It's always a massive event, the guys have a barrel of laughs and a lot of fun, but today the numbers were down and I guess the numbers of rabbits have been down as a result of that too, so it's an interesting time. There's just a lot of growth out there and things just haven't worked really for the favour of the old rabbit. The official count was 10,464 rabbits, less than half the toll from the year before. But it also nailed some possums, goats, stoats, cats and magpies too. And overall the contestants we spoke to had an awesome shoot, even if conditions were tough. In total we got 216. Yeah, and how many did you shoot? Eight. Yeah, and what was your favourite part of the shoot? Probably getting to see the, some cats running around on the land. All right, and you shot them too? Um, yeah. Awesome. We left them behind though. Our correspondent Benedict Collins reporting. And coming next, strikes, lockouts and splits, we take a look at the current state of the red meat sector. Stay with Sector Report. New Zealand's red meat sector is already an eight billion a year export earner with plans to push those annual foreign exchange earnings to nearly 12 billion by 2025. 
But today, the meat sector is making more headlines with its problems than its prospects. One of the country's major meat processors, AFCO, is locked in a bitter standoff with the Meat Workers Union, and another, Silver Fern, has split with the industry's major marketing and promotion organisation, Beef and Lamb New Zealand. Well, we're joined now by agriculture journalist, commentator and meat industry specialist, Alan Barber. Alan, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're seeing reports now that uh, New Zealand lamb has been priced out of the UK market. With the product in short supply, uh, prices up 16%, sales down 20%. What's the problem here? I thought we were supposed to be on top of the marketing. <laughs> well, the, pro the problem is that uh, just, just as in New Zealand, where the domestic demand for lamb has, has crashed because of the price, the same thing's happened in the UK in particular, which is a traditional lamb-eating market. And uh, they're really the poor consumer over there is saying, actually, I can't afford lamb any longer. So they're not eating as much of, of lamb. In, the, in its present format. Is there any impact uh, on supply from the AFCO dispute? No, I think not. Uh, there's, there's really, uh, AFCO's dispute started before the season got really underway. There's plenty of capacity out there to handle the lamb processing in the North Island in particular. So AFCO's dispute will affect AFCO, but it won't really affect New Zealand's ability so to meet its markets. It, it's actually a, a stock problem rather than a, a, a processing hiccup. Yes. I mean, mm. the, the, if you look at the financial results for the last uh, year leading to the end of December, uh, September and ANSCO's results just come out, uh, you can see that all the companies that report have got higher inventory levels than they had 12 months earlier. So clearly the market offtake wasn't as good as, uh, as, it, as it had been before. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the wholesalers were overstocked and they weren't going to be buying at high prices. Okay, um, let me just zero in on AFCO for a bit. How much impact is this dispute having on its production? I would think that it's probably operating at minimum 50%, maybe a little bit more than 50% of, uh, of its required capacity. And that will get, uh, get worse as we get into the height of the season because April, May is the absolute peak of the season for both cull cow processing and for lamb processing. And AFCO will struggle to keep up to 50%, I would think, during April, May. Okay. What are the key issues uh, that are in dispute here? It, it's difficult to judge it from the outside. The meat workers are talking. The company doesn't seem to. Well, the meat workers are not prepared to make any concessions um, in the, uh, to the terms that AFCO is, is requiring. AFCO says we want the right to manage our own business. We are not going to... Um, let the union dictate to us how we manage our business. There's been a lot of talk about tallies being hard bastards who mistreat their staff and uh, underpay them and require them to work long hours and antisocial hours. That's actually pretty inaccurate. Tallies are tough but fair employers. They are one of the biggest employers in New Zealand's uh, agricultural sector across meat, and ve uh, meat vegetables, dairy, um, fishing, and they have a policy of only employing New Zealanders uh, on, their, on their boats. They don't have any contracted uh, overseas contracted boats. So the, the, the reputation and the facts probably are not strictly accurate. To be fair, they have had stand-ups in other areas uh, that they, they operate in. in, in they have. In dairy and, and in the fisheries. They have, yes, but, but at the end of the day, they are one of New Zealand's bigger employers and they basically pay, pay fair rates for what they regard as a fair day's work. AFCO has a requirement to introduce certain things that the union is absolutely adamant it doesn't want to see. It, it affects um, production speeds and tallies uh, on the chains. It affects such things as drug testing uh, and seniority. Um, and basically, seniority is the is the policy of uh, of first in, last first out. Signed on. Yeah. And <clears throat> if people get to a certain age, and the meat industry is progressively aging, um, 
if they get to a certain age where they actually can no longer carry out the, uh, the hard chain type work, the processing work um, that pays best, um, then they can be converted to labourers on a lower rate. But of mm -hmm. course, under the, um, under the present collective agreement, uh, they, AFCO can't do that. It's coming to court towards the end of this month. Is that likely to be the crunch point? Um, we don't know what the result will be of the injunction that, uh, that the union has applied for. Um, AFCO will clearly have to, have to abide by the terms of the court ruling, although they may well appeal. Uh, I would imagine they will appeal that, um, that decision if it goes against them. Uh, because they're determined that this one, this is one that they they need to win to gather to gain for themselves the ability mm. to run their own plants properly. Quickly turning to the other sector, silver fern uh, and beef and lamb. How serious is that split? I don't think it's terribly serious. Um, uh, clearly, Keith Cooper um, got got He's annoyed. He's CEO of Silver Fern. C CEO yeah. for Silver Fern Farms. He was on the board of Beef and Lamb. He did. Um, get offended, take offence at certain things that, uh, that Beef and Lamb was doing. He believes that Beef and Lamb is um, conducting a divisive um, strategy um, which uh, is all designed to gain a, a referendum, positive referendum vote uh, from farmers at the next Commodity Levies Act referendum in a year or two's time. Um, He's you, would you say he's right, or is he wrong? I, I think he's exaggerating the, uh, the, th the threat. I think beef and lamb is doing what it believes it has to do to satisfy its farmer uh, constituency. I think meat, beef and lamb is a necessary representative industry good organisation which farmers will insist on uh, because they don't want the meat companies to be the only providers of information. The meat companies will always get upset with, um, with where they see beef and lamb treading on their toes and trying to claim things about the market. Uh, and of course the next thing that happened with, uh, with Silver Fern Farms and Beef and Lamb was the, uh, was the Farm IQ project <laughs> and the Beef and Lamb's Accelerating Best Practice project. And that's another story. And that's Alan another story. Barber, thank you very much. Agriculture journalist and meat industry specialist Alan Barber. In a moment, we'll find out if New Zealand can train its way out of a serious skills shortage affecting almost every sector of the primary industry in the country. That's next on Sector Report. At the beginning of this year, the Labor Department released its latest survey of skills shortages in New Zealand. It added five areas of agriculture science to the list and identified no less than 13 different specialist areas of agriculture management where qualified people are in short supply. While recruitment offshore may provide part of the solution, so does growing our own skills base through domestic training programs. But the government wants to rationalise the number of industry training organisations in the country and the qualifications they offer. So how will this affect the skill shortage in agriculture? We're joined now by the Chief Executive of Ag ITO, the primary industry training organisation, Kevin Bright. Kevin, welcome. Thank you, David. Look, where are these critical shortages in agriculture? Right, the main critical shortage across all the sectors is at that operational manager level. So we've got a large number of small to medium businesses who have got people in management roles and, and because of the growth in the industry a lot of them have actually been thrust into these roles maybe two or three years earlier than they should have been. So, so that's the, the critical so, shortage. So what happened? Did we have a, a sudden evacuation? <laughs> uh, people grow old and get out or what? Well, I think it's, it's a combination of the, of the natural progression of people moving out of the industry as they get older, but also the, just the growth in, in farms, growth in the business, and, and the growth in need for better management decisions as we've moved from the family-owned business to the, the more corporate-style business. How do you actually identify where the, short, the specific shortages are? 
I guess the, there's a lot of work being done by the industry itself, particularly the dairy industry, but also by the Department of Labor and Treasury. So there's a lot of work being analyzing the, the areas and it's those, those critical decision making areas, uh, the ability to analyze and interpret data. It's those sorts of more generic management skills really, rather than the technical capability uh, connected to the to the industry itself. Uh, yet we've got those five science areas where we're Correct. critically short. Um, I mean, uh, is this a, a domestic problem or a global problem? Well, the information that has been presented and the research that's been done has shown that New Zealand is performing worse than its OECD com compatriots. So we've got a bigger problem here than some other countries in the OECD. But having said that, it is a global phenomenon. What's actually causing the shortage though? Is it shortage of training capacity, shortage of funding or shortage of interest? I actually think it's a combination of all three, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So it's getting the, the right learning, the right training and the right capability building in the right places at the right time. It's quite a complicated uh, answer to that question. Yeah, I notice also that the shortages, um, there's one catch in them f from the training perspective. Uh, you can train people but you can't give them three years experience before they take up a job, can you? Well, that's the beauty of training in the vocational sector because okay. that's exactly what does happen. You get out in the field. So you're working in the field and you're learning at the same time and that, that is the, the real strength of the vocational system and that's why people from all over the world are coming to observe the New Zealand vocational system. It's a really good system. Okay, but how does the uh, government drive for rationalising industry training and, and the number of recognised qualifications affect uh, you in the agriculture sector? Well I actually totally support the government's drive here because we've got a large number of industry training organisations across, across the country and some of them are really small so critical mass is an issue and in our sector it's the, really the challenge that the government has put to us is if you perform, you'll be supported. Let me ask you about this question of rationalising the number of qualifications that there are. Uh, how do you go about that and who do you talk to when you say, OK, well, we think we can put A and B together? Right, that's, uh, that's another vexed conversation and once again, we actually support the drive for reduced I qualifications. I understand that, but I want, to, I want to know the hows. Do you go out and actually talk to the employers of these skilled Correct. people? And, and what uh, do you talk to, you talk to the sector organisations? Do you talk to the, the students? Do you talk to the potential entrants? Yes, to all of those. So we, yeah. we're, we're called a standard setting body and we're charged by NZQA to act on their behalf to manage qualifications in the agriculture sector. So we've been given the job that you've just described. Have you actually kicked it off? I mean, you were actually working on this, but because it's been the big structural things that you've been doing so far, you're getting organisations together. Yes. But now you move into this arena, which is quite obviously more complex. Very much so, and we started in October last year, so mm -hmm. we're, we're right in the process, and we've talked to all of the groups that you mentioned. We, we've got an ongoing conversation going on, and, and really the, the end game is to get agreement from all interested parties to a smaller number of qualification, but have a structure in place that allows the various parts of the sector to offer learning opportunities. Can you tell me how many qualifications you've rationalised down so far? So we're, we haven't rationalised any you in this process because we're only about a third of the way through it. It's going to take us a year or so uh, to work through the, the whole process, but really uh, the aim is to halve them. OK, a year out from now, you, you, you led with your jaw on that, a year out from now, what difference is the industry going to see in terms of the performance and the services delivered by your giant ITO? Right, so what we will be delivering is a, a far higher number of people who are actually completing the, their chosen courses that they're, that they're engaged in. So that requires us to work even more closely with employers than we currently do to ensure that employers are supporting the learning because that's one of the big barriers to success is employer support. So there'll be more people finishing their programmes, there'll be more people completing programs at the higher levels, so we'll be making a really positive contribution to the this big need of better performing operational managers. And I take it these are all in your KPIs for this next year? Correct. Correct. <laughs> well, we can all monitor progress. Kevin Bryant, thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Kevin Bryant, Chief Executive of Ag ITO, the primary industry's training organisation. And that's all for this week. Next week, we head to the Hawke's Bay to take a tour of Fed Farmers President Bruce Will's stunning family farm and gardens. Drew Chappell talks long-tailed ewes, storms and the future of sheep and beef with the Fed's main man. I like the concept of things being hidden away, so uh, very occasionally I stand up here and I can see a corner of a building and, and I often I'll shoot back and plant a tree just to cover <laughs> the corner. Remember you can check all our programming anytime online at country99tv.co.nz. Thanks for your company, I'm David Beetson for Sector Report. See you next week.